Now, so I, so what I want to get at is a similar relationship in biology. The question is, what are the parts and what's the whole? Um, I'm made up of a bunch of molecules. If I do a synchronic story and I say, I've got, you know, I've got hemoglobin molecules and, and, and you know, all, all the molecules that make me up, um, am I just this collection of these molecules? Well, in fact, the molecules are each made by each other. Uh, they don't exist independently. They wouldn't exist in the world if there wasn't this complex. In one sense, to describe the parts, you already need to know something about the whole, and you need something about its history. There's, there's not a nice, nice, neat compositional story to be told here. It's a compositional story across time, in which the reason that I have hemoglobin, and that, that hemoglobin is such a hugely, uh, you know, highly probable molecule on the surface of the Earth, has this incredible history, which is always involved in animal bodies in oxygen. Uh, in that sense, you can't decompose the body and say, OK, it's all these molecules, this explains the body. Uh, the molecules each explain each other in a troublesome sort of fused way. And in a sense, it's, it's an analogous kind of fusion in which you can't do this sort of myriological reconstruction. I uh, think that you're, you are mystery mongering what is probably the clearest case of reductionism in all of molecular biology. And in addition, the, the diachronic history from the beginning of the formation of the Earth until the point at which oxygen begins to not be a toxin right. and begins to be a, 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 an agent of life, right, is also something that is entirely explicable from a molecular biology so perspective. I'm not, uh, and I, I want to be clear to, that I'm not to saying it's Richard not. Richard, to confirm or disconfirm what I've said. <laughs> so, so I want to be clear that there's nothing that I said or suspect here that has anything that is not based upon fundamental laws of physics. That's not what I'm claiming, okay? Uh, what I'm claiming is that the specific molecules that make you and I up are the result of a series of accidental features in which they have constrained each other one after the other after well, the other. What do you mean by accidental features? Uh, well, I mean, the only accidents I can see in this whole scenario are quantum mechanics indeterminacies. If, aside from those, the whole thing is predictable. I mean, Besi it's, so, besides the fact that the whole base of it is, is indeterminate. Well, except, I mean, yeah, in, yeah. insofar as indeterminacy affects the course of biological evolution, we don't know that. I mean, I think it does because mutations are yeah, yeah. probably quantum phenomena. Yeah. But, but so it's still, you, they're still so, at the so, bottom of the laws of physics. So, right? well, so uh, the this, original range I'm not disagreeing with that. That's the funny thing um, about this. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, think uh, that's I, I have, I have. This is not about magic. This is about trying to figure out um, how best to describe these phenomena. And what I'm trying to suggest here is this notion that we're getting at. I think has relevance not just epistemologically, but I think it has relevance for not in, in actually the ontology of the emergent process. And that is uh, that things, information gets lost as you move up, or as, as uh, Anderson would have said, that it, you know, in a sense, you can't get back to it, you can't figure out the details, the details don't matter. Information gets lost, but structure also accrues. Right, right. right. Constraints accrue, yeah. yeah. Can I try something kind of like some kind of student? <laughs> We're all friends here, <laughs> But, um, so there are principles that are different from laws, right? So we have, uh, Sean mentioned, a very mm -hmm. short set of what we believe to be the fundamental laws. But there are lots of principles that those laws obey, and those principles seem to apply at many different levels, if I can stretch it right now, try to think it out as I'm, as I'm talking. So for instance, conservation of energy. You know, you talk about laws of economics, and, and those must respect this principle conservation of energy, right? And, and that is not a fundamental law. It's simply a principle that's respected by the fundamental laws and is able to carry on. After we coarse grain and lose some information, we somehow retain things like that. A principle of least action. Things tend to fall along the path of least resistance. It seems to be universally true. Again, it's not a new fundamental law that I add to matter and gravity, but matter and gravity respect this. I think the problem is that sometimes you do lose the principles. I mean, if you're if right. your system is open, then energy is not conserved. Right, but that's... You lose right. universal invariance. Sure, okay, but it's part of how you are defining your system, etc. So as long as... Okay, so it sets some boundaries. Right. You know, you define your system in such and such a way. Your law of economics might not, you know, be uniquely... Because I guess I didn't fully appreciate why uniqueness was being invoked earlier. Be derivable from, from quantum, you know, field theory versus some other field theory or some other, sorry, theory, but it must respect this principle, and that is deeply tied into the foundational law. Does that 
Is that interesting or relevant at all, or is it just totally irrelevant? Wait, so Are you all going to just like turn away and go back no, to the wait, previous wait. conversation? It's deep, deeply tied into. Well, Sorry. Did you, you, did you, Last oh, I, I just mean this this reductionist idea, it isn't so much that there is some unique outcome of the course graining process, or even that every you know theory of economics has to have as its foundation only one unique set of fundamental laws. I mean, this uniqueness seems to me to be not necessary to invoke. But what is necessary is that there are some principles that survive the course graining even when information is lost. Yes, yeah, fundamental right. physics constrains everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's not an issue. So, no, right. Nobody here is arguing for magic. I mean, that's, I think it, we have to be really clear. I don't think anybody here is arguing for magic or for mysticism for that matter. I, I or that you can escape fundamental physics, right? Yeah, that's right. Or the, yeah, that's right. Fundamental physics works. The question is how to, re, how to think about these problems of transition and of, of we've been calling levels. Um, and yet, take into account the fundamental changes of causality at the gross, gross level, at the, the coarse grain level, as you would call it, um, that, uh, that we see. The fact that living processes look like they're doing things very different than non-living processes, that mental processes look like they're doing something very different from just physiological processes. We want to explain those. And there's some fundamental shifts, uh, whether you call them phase shifts or whatever, we want to have an expl explanation for it that does not say, well, I don't want to investigate this because there's nothing interesting there. It's all just basic physics. Of course it's more than basic physics. There are principles, you want to call them principles, I would call them changes in boundary conditions or constraints. Uh, those are what are interesting and that's what I want to focus on, not the fundamental physics, or if the fundamental physics is somehow changed you know, as we move up the ladder, it's so, not. Could, I mean, you used the example of hemoglobin. Could you give us an alternative explanation for the evolution of hemoglobin? No, but I could give you all... Uh, Whenever organisms have evolved to the point where, as you say, oxygen is no longer a toxin, oxygen killed off most of life, you know, when it first appeared. Um, but there are lots of ways we can actually get oxygen and move it around. In fact, even on Earth, there are two kinds of globins that do this, the cyanoglobin and hemoglobin. Yeah. They are... Or big photosynthesis. I mean, they're all the different, yeah, different substrates. So, right? and again, there are some is, constraints, so there's many ways in which photosynthesis cannot evolve. That's right. And, and but but there's more than one way in which you can. And the right. function is, I, I, it's functioning is functioning for So this is, well, so this is a multi, multiple realizability question. Yes. It is, it's the var variation of the functionalism story that right. says, okay, how do we account for that? What kinds of, what are the rules that we will use in this game to account for this that don't violate fundamental physics, but help us explain how these things converge and why they cross certain thresholds when they do? There's, uh, I think, a vivid way of seeing the epistemological point. Um, Laplace's demon mm -hmm. and the biologist who isn't Laplace's demon are both looking at some planetary histories. And the biologist says, um, one of two things is going to happen. Either, uh, either you're going to get hemoglobin or you're going to get cyanoglobin. And that depends on, on factors that I can't say. And Laplace's demon is going to say, how do you know there's just two? Mm -hmm. And that fact is a principle that you get from the higher level uh, because they're both consistent with the, with the underlying physics. But biology tells you that, I, I'm sort of making this up, but the, yeah. there's, there's the two ways it can go. And uh, you don't know which way it's going to go, but you know it's going to be one way or the other. Well, I wouldn't, as a biologist, I wouldn't say there's just two ways to go. There's two ways it has gone. Yeah, right, right. right. But it'll probably be a metal that plays the role, copper or... I mean, I guess I don't understand what's new here. Um, as an evolutionist, you really can't predict what's going to happen because it's contingent on mutation, random mutations that are essentially unpredictable in my view, and environments which are very difficult to predict. So we don't know what's going to happen. And, but it's, yeah. it's, it's also complicated because the mutation that produces a change in the organism that changes the environment, that changes the selection of the True. organism. So you get this incredible nonlinearity in evolutionary biology. Uh, the remarkable thing is despite that nonlinearity, there's lots of convergence. And that tells us there's lots of constraints out there. Yeah. And it would be nice to know what those are.